Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trends for the 21st Century, Preparing for the Schools of Tomorrow. I'm the Assistant Commentary Editor here at Education Week, Mary Hendry, and today's webinar has been sponsored by Microsoft. Today, we'll be exploring the most important trends shaping education and society as a whole this century. This is going to be a good opportunity to step back from our daily responsibilities and distractions to think deliberately about the future that today's students are going to face both inside and outside the classroom. We could spend all day discussing Gary Marx's illustrious career, so I'll keep it brief to leave plenty of time for him to talk. Gary is the president of the Center for Public Outreach, an international consulting firm with a future-oriented bent. He's a prolific speaker, workshop leader, and author who has visited dozens of countries and worked with educators, business professionals, and government leaders. His latest book, 21 Trends for the 21st Century, serves as the basis for today's talk and has a lot of great insight and analysis that we won't have time to cover today. Before I hand the reins over to Gary, I want to review some quick technical aspects of today's presentation. If you're having any audio trouble, please find the audio settings on your computers and your speaker volumes and make sure they're turned all the way up. If that doesn't serve to solve the problem, there's a detailed audio troubleshooting file in the handouts folder at the bottom of the console. Um, we're also experiencing some technical issues on the phone systems at EdWeek today, so if you're having any problems, um, instead of calling in, please email webinar support at epe.org. Uh, you'll also find in the handouts folder some great supplemental resources for today's talk, as well as a copy of the slides to download. You'll see some other icons that open additional feature panels in our webinar console. You can read more about Gary Marks in the bio panel and follow the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag EWWebinar. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. So that should that cover it. Gary, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Mary. What a pleasure to be with with all of you, thank you for taking the time today to join us for this webinar here at Education Week. And I want to extend my thanks to Dave and Mary and Hyun Young and Rachel and Chris and Michelle and Greg and Jenny and so many others at Education Week who do such great work for all of us each and every day. And I know you're standing right now giving them an ovation, which they generously deserve. Uh, today we're going to be be talking about common purpose. We're going to be talking about the big picture, common ground, because these trends uh, have implications for everybody everywhere and for every school, every college, every university. And during the presentation, I'll be posing a lot of questions. In this case, they're rhetorical. But as you know, the questions about real world trends and issues can promote thinking, reasoning skills, learning across disciplines, active learning. Uh, learning through inquiry, you can continue the, <laughs> that discussion. And these trends are also an environmental scan that should be basic to our planning for the future, for the system, for our individual schools, for our programs, and so on. So I'll be doing the presentation on trends, and then we'll be having some questions that uh, you can, uh, that we'll try to respond to. And I am right now trying to move on to our, to our first uh, category in this presentation, which is about reality. Everything that happens in the world has implications for our communities, and it has implications for our schools. And in reverse, everything that happens in our schools has implications for our communities, and uh, it also has implications for the world as well. So that's one of the realities we face. We are of this world. We are not separate from this world. Uh, the story goes like this. An interesting thing happened on the way to achieving our plan. The world changed. <laughs> In fact, uh, it goes like this also. In 500 years, we've moved from a world where everything was certain and nothing changed to a world where nothing seems certain and everything changes. Change, of course, is inevitable. Progress is the thing that's optional. We need to have plenty of hindsight. We need to understand our history, our heritage, uh, and we need to also balance that hindsight with a great deal of foresight as we look to the future. And that's one reason why we need to pay attention to these future forces or trends. Uh, you want to see the future. OK, here's what you need to do. Just go into a school, those five-year-old kindergartners 
who start school in 2016 will turn 65 in 2076. Uh, those 18-year-old high school seniors who either have just graduated or will graduate in 2016 will be 65 in about 2063. So the future is in school today. Uh, and schools need to get their students ready for the future because that's where they'll be living their lives. We need to think about how are these fresh generations learning? How do they get their news? What are they asking? What are they curious about? What gets and keeps their attention? Here's uh, one of the questions I'm frequently asked, and I, as Mary said, have spoken in many different countries, many parts of the world, uh, and get a lot of questions. But here's a question I get every once in a while. OK, Gary, it starts. Uh, we're doing a lot, but what else can we do to get our students ready for the future in a fast-changing world? Now, I don't have the complete answer, but I have a part of it. I think we need to be passionate about making learning addictive. As you know, there are certain chemicals that can be addictive. Uh, there are smartphones that can be addictive. We need to make learning addictive. Here are some of the recent books. There's 21 Trends for the 21st Century, published by Education Week Press, both the full book, which has all the charts, the graphs, all the research. And then there's a smaller version, uh, which is called the guide, and that is available in case you want to distribute it to your entire community, the entire staff, and so on. And a companion book uh, published by ASCD is called Future Focused Leadership. So those are, those are two of the more recent books. So what do we mean by the sub subtitle, uh, Out of the Trenches and Into the Future? What that really means is that we need to back off to the big picture. We need to see things in perspective, to see them in context. And we need to avoid becoming entrenched. Uh, somebody comes to us with an idea, and we don't have time for it, so we dig a little trench around ourselves. Somebody uh, challenges the status quo. We don't have time for that either. So we dig a little trench. And before long, the trench is so deep <laughs> that we can't even see out the top of the trench. We've become entrenched. We don't want that to happen. Rather than digging trenches, we need to be seeking higher ground. You know what happens? When we understand trends and issues, people say that we're in touch. Uh, and when we don't understand trends and issues, people tell us that we're out of touch. So it's as simple and as complicated as that. Wherever I go, people are very proud to tell me that they are data driven. And that is very, very important. I thank you for paying attention to data. Of course, data often take, uh, takes a while because you know, you have to decide what data you might need, then you have to do the research, and then you have to review the search. You can need to come up with alternatives for implementation. All that takes time, and yet our world is moving along lickety-split. It's moving along very, very quickly. So we need to be data-driven, but we also need to be sensor-driven. We need to be aware of what's going on around us because some things won't wait for the data to come back and for us to implement it. The change we're seeing is quantum, it's exponential. Those are two words for the 21st century, quantum and exponential. Now, as we address these 21 trends, and we are not going to try to address each of them today, but uh, for ease in, uh, in reading and comprehension, we have divided them into a number of spheres in the 21 Trends book, which is available from Education Week Press. There's a demographic sphere. There is a technology sphere. There's an economic sphere. There's an energy and environment sphere. There's an international global sphere. There's an education and learning sphere. Uh, we'll talk about that. Now, some people will say, well, why don't we just talk about the education and learning sphere? The reason for that is that education uh, has implications for technology, for the economy, for energy, the environment, everything else. We also have a public and personal leadership sphere, and we have a well-being sphere that we discuss in the Trends book. Now, moving ahead, uh, the one thing you don't see on that Trends list is the white spaces, those spaces between and among those trends, where the trends overlap. Now, that's sometimes called convergence theory, when we make use of those white spaces and that overlap. That is where we discover new knowledge. It's where we engage in breakthrough thinking. It's where companies, uh, school systems, others develop new products and services. It's where we can anticipate issues. It's where we find a renaissance 
in multidisciplinary learning. And if you pay attention to the content of these trends and the processes that we use for dealing with them, you have immediate triggers for active learning, project-based education, real-world education, learning through inquiry, teaching, thinking, reasoning, problem-solving skills, and as we said, uh, learning across disciplines. And it's where we can find perspective and context. So you want an example of that. Uh, ask questions such as this, and you can develop your own if you'd like. What are the implications of poverty for education? Uh, what are the implications of polarization for the environment? What are the implications of ethics for our economy? What are the implications of our technology for almost everything? So here are some things I'd like to have you think about as we talk about these trends today. Take notes if you'd like. Ask yourself, what are the implications of these trends for how we operate our schools and school systems? Ask yourself, what are the implications of these trends for what our students need to know and be able to do to be prepared for the future? In a global knowledge information age, even an age of knowledge creation and breakthrough thinking. Also, uh, think about uh, what the implications of these trends might be for economic growth and development and quality of life in our communities. We often do community conversations and bring 50 to 300 people from many walks of life together and we present the trends and people ask these questions. And as a result, uh, the school or school system becomes the crossroads, the central convening point for the community. Got a good friend uh, in Paris whose name is Michel Godet. He's a leading French futurist. I wish you were here. I'd like to have the two of you get to know each other. But one of the things Michel says is, the faster the car, the stronger the headlights must be. So we're going to flick on the headlights right now and take a look at the economic sphere. This is where we look at the economy, jobs, and careers, and so on. Uh, there's a gentleman named Jeff Email. I'll bet you've heard of him. You've, he's been in the news with the political campaign recently. He's the CEO at General Electric. And as we were moving into the Great Recession, Jeff Email said this, the economic crisis doesn't represent a cycle. It represents a reset. It's an emotional, social, and economic reset. Now, here's what happens. I can take you back to the long depression, arguably got underway in the 1870s. I can take you back to the Great Depression that arguably got underway in the late 1920s and 1930s. I can take you back to the Great Recession, and we're just crawling out of that right now. What happens is when we go through these economic crises, we're moving into a new age. We move from the agricultural into the industrial age. Now we're moving into a global knowledge information age. Our technologies and our lifestyles have outgrown our infrastructure. It becomes like trying to put a size 12 foot in a size eight shoe. It doesn't fit anymore. Physical infrastructure is extremely important. Our roads, our bridges, our waterways, and you can add to that list, but so is our social infrastructure, education, health, the environment, and virtually everything is going through a reset. Our lifestyles are going through a reset. The media are going through a reset. Locations where people choose to live going through a reset. Transportation is going through a reset. Before long, we'll see more autonomous driverless cars. Uh, jobs are going through a reset. Uh, you know, those 1950s jobs, they're not coming back. Uh, and education is going through a reset. So many of you know that already. In fact, you are in the process of leading us through this, this reset. Nobody gets a free pass. And we can count on one thing for sure, and that is that the expectations are going to continue to change. Now, let's uh, hop out of the uh, economic trend into the uh, demographic sphere, where we discuss aging, diversity, and generations. Uh, we coexist today because people are living longer with about six generations. The GI generation, the silence, the baby boom generation, Generation X, the millennials, and the Generation E who are coming along even as we speak. Here's a startling fact about, the, about demographics, and you know this already. Beginning in 2011, our boomers started hitting 65 at the rate of about 10,000 a day. You can imagine that. And that trend is going to continue for about 25 or 30 years. Uh, our boomers are now between about 51 and 70 years of age. And as if by some demographic magic, the very next year in 2012, the oldest of the millennials started turning 30. 
Uh, they're now approximately between 12 and 33, and in 2050, you move out to 2050, our millennials are going to be in prime time, ages 47 to 68, and they are going to hold nearly every uh, elective and appointive political office, local, state, national in our nation, and many of the highest offices internationally as well, and they'll be running a, a great number of our of our corporations or whatever replaces corporations in the future. Who knows? Uh, here's some other dramatic facts about demographics because we live uh, in a place that's known for its pluralism uh, and many parts of the world are becoming more pluralistic. Uh, birth rates have a huge impact on demographics. So does this age of massive migration and we're seeing people migrating all over the globe. We're seeing increasing numbers of refugees in addition to people who are following opportunities wherever they can find them across mountain ranges and oceans and everything else. In the United States, non-Hispanic whites will become less than 50% of the total population by 2043. Now, I don't make these things up. That's from the U.S. Census Bureau. Here's another startling demographic fact. In the fall of 2014, minorities, traditional minorities, became the majority of students enrolled in U.S. schools. And the same thing has happened in the 2015-16 school year. Now we're, um, we're moving into uh, another sign of demographic uh, consistency and change. Let's go worldwide for a moment. The most spoken languages in the world. Mandarin Chinese for decades has been the most spoken language in the world, uh, first language. Uh, a couple of years ago, number two was English. Now it's Spanish. Third is English. Then we have Hindi, Urdu, Arabic, Portuguese, Bengali, Russian. And I can see you right now saying, we have kids in our school who, teach, who, who speak more languages than that. Yes, you do. But these are some of the most spoken languages as first languages in the world. You move out to 2050 and the top five will stay about the same. Languages used on the web. A lot of us sit down at the web and we think everybody is using the web in English or whatever our chosen language. The fact is that about 26% of the web is done in English, about 21.5% in Chinese, about 7.5% in Spanish, about 4.8% in Arabic. So there you go. That's uh, some of the challenge we face demographically. Let's move quickly to the technology sphere. Here's where we discuss technology and identity and privacy. We live in a highly connected world. And let me just share this fact with you. By the end of 2015, we were expecting to have about 3.2 billion, with a B, people uh, with access to the Internet. Now, for comparison purposes, that's compared to about 400 million in 2000. Now, that is what I call a quantum increase. We're seeing vast changes in technology and the access people have to technology and to the Internet. Some of the challenges for schools as, uh, as we deal with technology, we could spend all day long talking about technologies, but we, <laughs> we don't have all day. So let's take a look at a few of the challenges that we face in our schools dealing with technology. I think one challenge is curating, creating, procuring content. We, we constantly have to ask, is it safe, is it secure, is it aligned with our learning goals? Houston's power-up program is trying to deal with that even as we speak. And that's very, very important. There's a, there's a follow-on question that I have. Uh, we need to make sure that our curriculum is aligned to our learning goals. We also don't we need to be sure that our learning goals are aligned with the needs of society and with the possibilities of each and every one of our students as we personalize education. Another challenge for schools is analyzing, analyzing and using the data. Uh, are we capable of collecting, analyzing, using the data before the problems, before the opportunities, before the people, before the processes have already changed? <laughs> now we're ready to change, but it's already changed. Uh, are we using artificial intelligence? Are we uh, comfortable with virtual and augmented reality? Uh, some of the questions, are we comfortable with machine-generated research? Uh, are we uh, comfortable with machine-generated analysis, recommendations? I hope so. We don't have to accept them, but they're worth our consideration, and they can be very helpful to us. 
Another is how do we handle virtual field trips? Okay, kids, today we're going to take a field trip to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we're going to go to the Great Canyon, uh, Great Grand Canyon. How do we how do we deal with that? And then uh, how are we using augmented reality as a part of education? Here's another challenge we face, and I've been talking about this for decades. Uh, I believe that educators, uh, in addition to being age group specialists, curriculum specialists, uh, need to understand that we are fast becoming orchestrators, concert masters, facilitators of learning, and every minute that goes by, we're uh, drawing from an exponentially expanding array of possibilities. Thanks to technology and thanks to our curiosity, that's made that possible. I wanted to share this with you about technology. There's a projection that I'd like to have you think about. The amount of data on the planet, uh, it's expected to grow about tenfold between 2014 and 2020. Uh, in, in 2014, we had about 4.4 zettabytes of uh, data on our planet. By 2020, we're expecting to have about 44 zettabytes of data. Can you imagine that? A tenfold increase. And if you don't pay attention to a lot of the zettabytes, it's not anything like a mosquito bite. A zettabyte is approximately equal to 1 billion gigabytes. Now, I am not going to have time to talk individually about a lot of technology issues and questions, so I want to just go through a number of questions for you to think about and maybe to share with your students in your school system. This first question, I was in a school system a while back. I talked to all the adult groups. I talked to the teachers. I talked to the administrators. talked to a community group. I, I went to a, a storefront classroom where kids were doing entrepreneurial activities, coming up with new products and services. And then the administration wanted me to meet with a kindergarten group. And they didn't give me any instructions. So I went into this kindergarten, and all these kids were arrayed on the big rug. And I sat there, and I thought, the best thing we can do is just ask each other questions. So we just had a wonderful time, having a great time. And one of the questions I asked about 10 minutes before the end of our session was this. Who's at fault if a driverless car gets into an accident? These are kindergartners. All the hands went up. I pointed at one of these uh, kindergartners in the back, and I said, well, what do you think? He said, I think that the attorneys are going to have to hammer this out. And then there was a, a little girl right down front, and she was waving her hand so hard, I thought it was going to fly off her arm. So I said, what are your thoughts? She put a finger on her chin, and she looked up in the air a little bit, and she nodded at me and said, uh, I think it's definitely a software problem. So, you know, even kindergartners, you know, at that early age are thinking about big issues. Here's another burning question. Is download speed becoming a civil right? Uh, should we insist on community-wide hotspots to level the playing field? Another burning question. Uh, who's right about the back door to the terrace iPhone? You know, it stimulates discussion. Is it, is it Apple? Is it a technology company? Or is it the FBI? Um, should computer coding count as a foreign language or just another language? Another burning question. Do values drive technology or does technology drive our values? So a few of the burning questions we face. We're going to take a little pause now for uh, a word from our sponsor. And Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, like Gary said, we're going to hear a quick message from today's sponsor, Microsoft. Hi, this is Cameron Evans from Microsoft. And thanks, Gary, for this uh, intriguing conversation. As we look at these skills for what I typically call the 21st and a half century, we have to really start thinking differently about what skills our students are going to be able to practice and develop mastery around. And at Microsoft, we lay out these five as the most connected skills that are going to be allowing students to be successful as they enter the second half of this century. Creativity through computational thinking and understanding that these become the skill sets that don't become digitized, don't become automated or easily outsourced. And as we go towards the latter half of this conversation today, we'll talk about how do we build the practice, the tools, and the teacher capacity to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks so much to Microsoft for sponsoring our session today. We're going to now move into the education and learning sphere. 
where we discuss personalization, ingenuity, the depth, breadth, and purposes of education. There's a chapter about every one of them in, in our 21 Trends book. So uh, let's, uh, let's dive in for just a moment. Uh, just in, in transition, I would like to, to provide you with a premise that uh, we need sound education policy. But we need to make sure that our sound education policy is built on a foundation of sound economic policy and sound social policy. Now, as we were doing our Delphi, uh, as we did research for the 21 Trends book, and I had this magnificent Futures Council 21, 26 people, most of them from North America, but they were from five continents. And we did a double round Delphi study. And I kept getting comments like this back from that Delphi group. And I've developed a hybrid statement based on what they were telling me. They said, basically, get ready for lifelong learning that is any time, any place, any pace, any way. Let me repeat that. Get ready for lifelong learning that is any time, any place, any pace, any way. Now, should that be a threat to us? I don't think so, because it's already a reality. Uh, and I think we need to ask what are the implications for our students. Here's something that I heard Steve Jurbitson talking about. He's a venture capitalist. He's helped to, in funding projects such as SpaceX and Hotmail and uh, Neophotonics and so on. did a presentation at a World Future Society conference a while back, and he devoted maybe a minute to education. But one of the things he said that I wanted to share with you today, he said, kids have the world of knowledge at their fingertips. Some kids in elementary school are doing the equivalent of postgraduate work. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think it's something we need to think about. What are the implications for our school? And here's one that I'd like to share with you. We have the Every Student Succeed, Succeeds Act, ESSA. And that's the new iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And what it's doing is pushing more control to the state and local levels. So we went through a period when we could point at Washington and say it's their fault, and now those fingers are going to be pointing more squarely at us. In other words, our hot seat just got a little bit hotter. So how should we redefine accountability? I think we have a period now when we can sit down and talk about how would we like to be held accountable, and we need to share that, share that thinking with our state and federal and local officials. because. But we're the ones closest to the game, and we're the ones who ought to be thinking about that and sharing our wisdom. Well, let's move into uh, to some of these personalization and education and learning trends. When you think about personalization, we live in a market of one society. We want everything tailor-made for us, whether it's the clothes we wear, the apps in our smartphone, everything else. We want everything to be tailor-made just for us. Now, to do that, we need, we need to understand diversities. We need to understand differences. We need to understand uh, the differences in abilities, talents, skills, aptitudes, motivations, interests, dreams, cultural backgrounds, national origins, languages, genders, gender preferences, other social and economic factors, neural diversity. And we're hearing much more discussion of neural diversity since we've We've been hearing more and more about uh, the increased incidence of autism, for example. Neuroscience, multiple intelligence have become driving forces for us. Now, the interesting thing to me about all these diversities is that you deal with these issues each and every day without breaking your sweat. Uh, you deal with a highly diverse world. Here's another factor, I think, that has a profound impact on, on personalization. It's standards and testing. I believe in standards. I, I believe we need standards. We need testing. We need assessment. However, I believe that we have developed a kind of scoreboard mentality that leads us to believe that we can get our education scores the same way we get our football scores, our basketball scores, and our baseball scores, and our hockey scores, and our soccer scores. And it simply isn't that easy. But it's all part of this culture we have of winners and losers, the old bell, bell curve culture that we've developed. And we've developed what, uh, what I sometimes refer to as the tyranny of the average. Uh, and you know, if our goal might become a number. Take our average up two points. If you do that, congratulations, 
uh, you know, in arrears or in advance, that is a huge accomplishment. But our goals really need to be tied toward individual students at our school. And I think we need to look at our testing and our assessment, and we need to look for clues, not always just conclusions for our scoreboard. Uh, let's let's go to um, another part of, uh, of our discussion of education and learning, uh, and that is the whole idea of releasing ingenuity. Uh, we, I think, all agree that we need to, to uh, consider thinking, reason, problem solving, learning, and imagining across disciplines as basic skills. Uh, we need to create intellectual entrepreneurs. You show me a person who's curious and persistent, I'll show you a person who will be pretty well educated for the rest of her or his life. And I believe that all of us uh, need to see things in a new light. We need to help our students see things in a new light. You know, you can take anything that happens, you can take any idea, you can put it in a 1970s frame, you can put it in a 1990s frame, you can put it in a 2016 frame, you can put it in a 2050 frame. Uh, and I think we need to be adept at doing that. We need to learn how to discover, and we need to encourage discovery among our students. And we need to be able to deal with paradox, controversy, and complexity and encourage our kids to be able to do the same thing. Because we live in an era of, of uh, paradox, controversy, and complexity. You know and I've known people who when something goes wrong, they say, who did something wrong? Who made the mistake? And the fact is maybe nobody made a mistake. It's the fact that the world has changed around us. So what worked for five years may not work anymore. Paradox, controversy, and complexity are part of a day's work. They're not unusual, and we need to see them that way and see them as part of what creates some of the excitement that we have in our education system. We also need to let our students know that we're depending on them to conceive of new knowledge. We need to do that as well. We need to come up with creative solutions to problems, whether they're old problems, new problems, and let our students know that we expect the same thing of them. We need to encourage questions. You know how to teach thinking, reasoning, problem-solving skills. One was, is with the basic principles. And then we teach those kids to ask good questions. And we need to model that by asking good questions ourselves. Uh, and then uh, good old Sir Ken Robinson, you know, our guru, uh, tells us that we are, in some cases, we are killing creativity in our schools. And I think in some cases he's right. Somebody comes up with uh, an idea, uh, and we say, I wouldn't do that if I had all the money in the world. Uh, you know, we're critical. And, some, and sometimes the adults in our school system, sometimes the students say, I won't come up with another idea as long as I live because it hurts too much. We need to encourage some risk-taking, which I call intellectual bungee jumping. And we need to encourage some tinkering because sometimes it's in tinkering that we find some of the uh, some of the new ideas, and then if we can't many make learning addictive, somebody else uh, will find a way of doing that uh, and maybe leave us behind. We don't want that to happen. Uh, uh, here's some question practice uh, for thinking, reasoning skills, learning through inquiry, real world education, active learning. Uh, it, here's a question you might have people think about: uh, Is Snowden a hero or a traitor? That will stimulate a discussion. Here's another one. Which of the following has the greatest impact on humanity, Palo Alto or Los Alamos? That's a big one, people to research, discuss, and uh, it stimulates thinking. Now let's move to another of these learning uh, trends, education and learning trends, uh, the need for depth, breadth, and purposes in education. As you know, there's growing concern that with high-stakes testing, with the narrowing standards for schools, many school systems have been pushed toward narrowing the curriculum. As we move into the future, if we're really serious about all this, we need to make sure that we are providing depth, breadth, and constantly looking at the purposes of education. Uh, one of the purposes of education is, I might ask, is math the purpose of education? Is reading the purpose of education? The arts the purpose of education? Uh, I don't think they're the purposes of education, although they're fully essential. 
let's back off to the, the purposes. And I'm just trying these on. You can change them. You can discuss them, whatever you'd like. I believe one of the purposes of education is citizenship. We need to help students become good citizens of a, of a family, good citizens of a, a school, a school system, a college, a university, good citizens of a community, good citizens of a, a country, good citizens of the world. We need to help students become employable. And I don't mean training people for every job that exists out there, but there are certain things that we need to know and be able to do to be employable. We need, for example, thinking and reasoning skills. We need problem solving skills. We need to, to be able to work as members of a team. We need math. We need physics. <laughs> we need technology. We need maybe to be able to code. Uh, we need many other things. We need uh, the behavioral sciences, the social sciences. We need to be able to create, be creative and imaginative. We need the arts, and you can add to that list. I believe another purpose of education is to help people live interesting lives. As you know, the more we know, the more experience we have, the more interesting life becomes. Another purpose we just talked about, and that's releasing ingenuity that's already there, that nobody has discovered, maybe not even the person who has the ingenuity. And then we need to stimulate imagination, creativity, and inventiveness. I just want to add something as kind of a foundation to all of these things I've mentioned, and that is the our kids, when they graduate from school, are not going to, in their cap and gowns, run across a tarmac and get into a capsule and blast it off to Mars. They're going to hold a lot of jobs between now and then, between now and their ultimate goal. So they need some saleable skills, like how to manage it, how to manage their time, how to plan, how to develop and manage a budget, how to work as members of a team. That's why mentorships and internships are becoming so important. A person I've uh, met, worked with a little bit, a uh, couple of times uh, at World Future Society conferences is Brian David Johnson. He is the director of future casting experience research at Intel. He is the person who studies social science research. He studies technology. And he is the one who recommends products and services that Intel might want to create and sell in five years or 10 years from now. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what he's creating uh, and recommending, but one of the things he says in his presentation is this, we need a new narrative. So I ask you, what is the narrative for your classroom? What's the narrative for your school? What's the narrative for your community? What's the narrative for our country? Brian David Johnson says we should change the story people tell themselves about the future they will live in. So what is our narrative? Our narrative can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, uh, again, as simple and as complicated as all that. Now let's uh, go to the public and personal leadership sphere. And here's where we discuss polarization, authority, ethics, continuous improvement. And we're going to discuss just a few of those. Polarization is eating our lunch. Uh, and it simply has to yield to evidence, to reason, to consideration of other points of view. Uh, we. We have lots of smackdowns today. We have lots of gridlock, but it's getting us nowhere. Tom Friedman, uh, the columnist, said that uh, a problem we have is we're so polarized that the best we can hope for is suboptimal decisions that represent the average of all interest groups. That's not good enough. The world is moving too quickly. Another of the chapters in our book, one of the uh, public personal leadership areas, is sustainability. Uh, and a lot of people think sustainability is making sure we can go from January 1st to January 1st and nothing changes. Well, that's not sustainable at all. Sustainability is based on adaptability and resilience, not on simply maintaining the status quo. And then a third of these uh, chapters is uh, devoted to ethics. I, I give speeches about ethics. I do workshops about ethics. I write articles about ethics. Uh, there's a chapter in the book about ethics, and I'm going to I'm going to boil it down to one sentence: If we don't do unto others as we would have them do unto us, we are headed directly for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and we are indeed on the empathy arrogance continuum. If you have great empathy, then you care about the decisions you make or don't make, and the implications they have for people. If you're arrogant, you really don't care. 
Are we preparing our students to have a good balance between empathy and arrogance? I think it's a really important question. And I believe that every leader, public and private, personal leader, needs to be a talent scout. Um, I believe that as leaders, we need to give people permission to develop their own greatness, whatever that might be. We need to give people permission to pursue their skills, their talents, their abilities, their insights. And I believe that true leaders are always preparing the next generation of leaders, the people who will follow them. Sometimes these things are like the elephant in the room. They're so big we don't see them. Uh, at a World Future Society conference with Paul Sappho from Stanford, he said, we are sometimes lost with compasses in our hands. And I think he's absolutely right. Well, those are some of the trends. So what can we do about these trends? What can we do with them? One, I think we can use these trends as an external scan, as we do our planning. We can use them as an intelligence report. You know, the president sits down with somebody who brings in the book every day and does intelligence, an intelligence report, knee to knee. Well, it's a kind of intelligence report. We need to consider it that way. We can consider implications of these trends for policy, for planning, for programs, for classroom instruction, for resources we need, for communication, uh, for the education system we need to become. Uh, we can do trend and issue analysis. In uh, trend analysis, we ask, what are the implications of these trends? Issue analysis, we ask, uh, you know, what are, what are the probabilities that these are going to become major issues? What will the impact be if they become major issues, the flexibility impact matrix? There's flexibility innovation analysis. You can describe a flexible, innovative organization and then ask, yeah, how are we doing in fulfilling uh, that uh, hope that we become a flexible, innovative organization? And we can use gap analysis, describe the organization, the institution we need to become, and then decide what it is that we need to do to get to that aspiration. Uh, we can also use re a reputation analysis. And with reputation analysis, which I often call uh, aspirational leadership, we can ask, how would people describe our organization today? And then ask, how would we like to have them describe our organization in 2020, for example? Uh, so <laughs> what do we need to do? What behaviors do we need to change in order to get from where we are to what we want to become? Uh, we should uh, consider professional development programs, uh, inclusive community conversations, futures councils. Uh, we should plan on using the information from these trends to stimulate active learning. Uh, share the ideas, the information in articles you write, in presentations you do, uh, and be a future-focused leader. But whatever position you hold, and be sure that staying in touch is part of everybody's job. I think that's the work of a leader, to make sure that we understand that in education, everybody, whatever job they hold, is a leader. We play different roles in the system, but all of us in education are leaders by virtue of the important role we play in society. And I'd like to have you keep this in mind as we back off to the big picture. This is an elephant in the room. If we don't constantly take the initiative to create the education system we need, somebody else will, and they'll simply announce it to us. Now, Jane Goodall is this widely known, world-renowned British primologist and anthropologist. As an educator, as a person who's concerned about education, I'd like to have you think about what, what she shared with all of us. She said, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents. We have borrowed it from our children. I thank you so very, very much uh, for being with us today. I'm sorry to talk so quickly because there's just so much to cover in a limited amount of time, and we've covered the tip of the iceberg. And I think Mary is going to lead us now in a question and answer uh, session. So uh, here's Mary. Thanks, Gary. So we've been getting a lot of great questions, and if you don't see it, um, there's a little question icon at the bottom of your screen if you want to submit questions. To start off, we've been getting quite a few questions about priorities, uh, how district leaders, principals, teachers, people who are on board with what you're saying, and they want to get there, but they have low budgets to contend with, they have 
um, limited PD time, they have a whole host of other responsibilities and problems, what would you say to them to how they can prioritize this? When, when we talk about these trainings, we're not talking about another program to add to your list of things to do. We're talking about the fact that whatever priorities you set, Consider these forces in society that have implications for our schools and our school systems, our colleges and our universities, and for every one of our students. As you develop your program, as you develop your learning goals, as you develop your budgets, keep in mind that these trends are going to continue to perk along. And if we decide not to pay attention to them, then you know they're going to continue to move anyway. So, Consider your program, consider your budgets, and all the rest in light of these trends, whatever resources you have available. But it's not a separate program. It's a way of thinking, a way of putting the world to work for you to make sure that we're in touch uh, and as in touch as possible. Mary? Great. So we have one participant, Billy, wants to know about how we think about time differently. And are we interested in escaping from the Carnegie unit and the status quo of where and when learning happens? Well, we have certainly had the Carnegie unit for a, a long, long time. Uh, and, and we've used it to measure uh, how much uh, seat time people have had in a course, for example, in a class. And then we, of course, award that based on how well they tested, how well they might have performed. And I think that uh, I think the Carnegie unit has had has had real value, but uh, I think that we need to, as we move into the future, consider that uh, education is not quite so simple as some people once thought it might have been. Uh, we need to think more deeply about how do we credit people for multidisciplinary learning, for example, those things that don't maybe have their own Carnegie unit, for coming up with new discoveries that. Uh, our course catalog had not even dreamed of yet. Um, and then I think we need to put this in another flask over here, another uh, basket, and consider the whole idea of disciplines, because Carnegie units are based often on disciplines and the courses we develop around them. Ed Wilson, the noted philosopher, uh, scientist, um, and I, a, a real guru, uh, has observed that disciplines are sometimes the artifacts of scholarship. So we, we need our disciplines, but we needed them particularly for teaching because we had to break things up into chunks so that we could more easily teach them. But what happens is we come out of school and we have to live in a highly interdisciplinary world. And that's one thing that Ed Wilson keeps telling us, and I think Ed Wilson is right. So yes, the Carnegie Unit has been important. I think it's been a guide for us. But I think that we need to be very, very creative as we move into the future because the Carnegie unit should enhance what we're doing and not stand in the way of the progress that we really need. So those are just some thoughts. This is, those, this is not the final word. This is just some thinking for you to consider. Mary? Great. And also bringing together another theme that we're seeing pop up in the question box quite a bit, how do you engage the community? and especially community members who are disenfranchised or might not value education or business leaders who have something to offer. Um, can you talk a little bit about community engagement? I think a, a key to community engagement is always stay in touch. Uh, we don't try to freeze people out, but sometimes people feel frozen out. They, they feel that we haven't had children in school for forever. You know, that our kids are now in their 50s. We're still interested, but we don't really feel comfortable. We don't find a reason to go to the school to find out what's going on. We might be seen as an intruder of some kind. I think that a good way to keep people engaged and doing it systematically is to hold listening sessions, to, to invite people to come to school, uh, lay out briefly, what we're trying to accomplish. What are our goals for kids? What are some of the programs that we're offering? And then ask for counsel and really listen to the counsel and make sure that you active listen so that when people suggest something or say something, 
that you use a part of what they suggested as you provide your answer. People need to be heard. Uh, and the fact is that if people know we're hearing what they say, we'll listen to what else we have to say. That's kind of the key. Then there are some processes we need to consider. I talked a little bit in our presentation about community conversations, and they are extremely important. I've, I've done a number of them, uh, and they're really exciting events because you invite people from all walks of life. Uh, might be anywhere from 50 to 300 people who come together. I remember doing one of these things uh, in Minnesota during a blizzard on a Saturday morning. And people needed to get home, but nobody left. They stayed with us all morning and into part of the afternoon because I think it was just so exhilarating. You know, here was the leading institution in the community. The education system was asking people in business and government uh, for their counsel. One of the things that happened uh, several years ago, there was an education summit. It was held in Charlottesville, Virginia, the university. They invited business people and they invited uh, government leaders, but they, they left out the educators because the, both of those communities at that time, this is a long time ago, said, well, the educators uh, are committed to the status quo, so we probably wouldn't get very far in our conversation. We need to be the ones who are calling those meetings. We need to be the ones who are inviting members of the business community, members of the broader community, uh, and uh, political and community leaders to meet with us. That makes us the central convening point uh, and, the, uh, and the crossroads of our communities. And, we need to be the ones who pull people together. A way of doing that on a smaller scale, and, and you can do them simultaneously if you'd like, is to have futures councils. And maybe groups of six, eight, ten people and, and have a rotating membership. So every time you meet with them, there's a different membership. What you're trying to do is listen to as many people as possible. Maybe hold one of these gatherings once a month every six weeks and call this group together and say, what are you hearing? What are some of the trends? that you're hearing in our, in our schools? What do you think some of the implications might be for? These are just a few of many, many ways. Of course, with using technology, of course, you can have chats. You can do all kinds of uh, Q and A's uh, using technology. But you know about all those things uh, anyway. So here's Mary. Great. So on a practical level, Katya wants to know, I would be interested to know how policymakers can use curriculum to adapt to the changes presented. Do you have any words of wisdom for that? How policymakers can use curriculum. Uh, I believe that if, if uh, we listen to those who develop curriculum, I'm talking about the people in our schools, the people who advise us on curriculum and so on, then that can help uh, lead us, especially if we have a future-oriented curriculum. If we are indeed committed to getting our students ready for life in a global knowledge information age, even an age of knowledge creation and breakthrough thinking, then we need a policy foundation, a policy framework that will support that. As we all know, policy books become very, very large. The older a school system is, the thicker its policy book. And a policy book is generally full of things that we decided at one time or another that allow us to do certain things and prevent us from doing others. That's why occasionally we do a review of our policy. Every time a law changes, that has implications for the school. We have a new policy that's added. We need to, as we develop our new policies, need to consult with those people who provide leadership for our curriculum and instruction to make sure that we have the policies that enable that to happen. I'm not talking about policies that simply freeze the status quo. I'm talking about policies that support uh, an education system that is committed to getting students ready for a global knowledge information age. Mary? Okay, so we're running low on time, so we're going to ask just one more question. Gary, in a minute and a half, um, someone wants to know if there's one takeaway that a teacher candidate could bring from your talk. What would you want that to be? I think the one takeaway is a, a big picture item, and that is 
we need to make sure that we stay in touch with the needs of society, the whole of society, because our school serves our community. But we also know if we live in a small community that isn't necessarily diverse, the fact is that our students are going to come out of our schools and they're going to go into a highly diverse world. So we need to consider the fact that we are influenced by a number of forces in society. We call them trends. You can stay in touch with some of them through our 21 Trends book. So I think then we need to consider what the implications of those trends are for us as teachers, as administrators, as school board members, as involved people in the community, as people who work in any business, any industry. So I think the, uh, the real secret is a big picture item, and that is to always try to stay in touch. Be interested in virtually everything, from transportation to medicine to the infrastructure of our nation and to politics and world affairs because we're preparing the students who will have to deal with all of the above. They are the ones who will help us deal with the environment. They're the ones who will help us develop new sources of energy. And the beautiful thing is that the future is in school today, and we are lucky enough to live at this time in history when we can help educate those kids and shape those lives for the future. Thank you so much, Mary, and thanks to each of you for being with us today. I've loved every minute of it. Mary? Thank you, Gary. So now we've got a quick message from our sponsor, Microsoft. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Mary. And thank you all for participating in this conversation. It's super important that we prepare our students for the 21st century and make sure that they're going to be successful there. As we look at what Microsoft is doing in education, there are a few things that I just want to bring to your attention as you get ready for the summer. Uh, first and foremost, Windows 10, as it's been out for almost a year now, about 300 million people are using Windows 10. But what I want you to think about in this context was that a few years ago, the President challenged companies around the country to help with the Connect Debt Initiative. And the goal was to simply to get devices to the price less than the cost of textbooks. We looked at the cost of textbooks, they range from um, 400 to 700 dollars per student per year and today we actually have um, devices that cost less than the price of the shoes on our kids feet it's absolutely amazing how the economics have changed and the way technology is moving and with Windows 10 you can do that on a multitude of platforms on the things that have large 80 inch screens like our surface hub all the way down to even things that don't have screens at all like the new HoloLens but as we think about how do we get students engaged in computational thinking and creativity one of the cool things you can do with Windows 10 as well is turn an Xbox into a development units so that those students that play games can now learn to author those games and tell stories in this new creative canvas. As we go into the summer, we're getting ready for a new update. We call it the anniversary update for Windows 10. And there's lots of cool things that are going to be happening. But one of the things that we're really excited about is how digital inking is going to be even more of a first class experience with Windows 10. And we, we're excited about that because when it comes to technology, the technology should not prescribe or pre-direct the way learning should happen. Some devices you can only touch, some devices you can only use the keyboard. But when we see students from an anthropological point of view, some kids actually want to write, whether they're doing math or science, research shows that when we're we're doing digital hand, handwriting, whether it be digitally, digitally or using pen and paper, that our brain, our neurons, operate a different center of our brain for actually learning the content than we do when we're just recording that content with a keyboard. So having that as a first class opportunity, super smart, and you can have a multitude of devices that facilitate that to help students. With the anniversary update, it's going to be free, but I want to highlight that there is an education SKU, a Windows 10 and education SKU um, that has a number of the same features that are in the Enterprise view, but it's also a superset of capabilities. There new, uh, there's a new test-taking app so that students and teachers that need to do formative type of assessments as well as summative assessments at the end of the year and have that experience completely out of the box, and also new tools to help you get set up in the classroom in a meaningful way without having to do a whole bunch of gyrations. It's, it speeds up the time to actually getting Windows 10 deployed, and it's going to be available for everyone as we 
move into the um, summer months. So look forward to more updates coming on the Windows 10 anniversary update. But to develop practice around these skill sets that we talked about for the 21st and a half century, uh, we need to have tools that are freely available to students to use throughout the year, throughout the summer, even in the off months. And with Office 365, one of the things that most people don't know about is that Office 365 in the education space is available to teachers and students at no cost when you have that license for your institution. And you can install it on eight, up to five different devices, even on Windows devices. The great thing about working at Microsoft in this day and age is that you don't have to always have Windows to have Microsoft technology. Whether you have Android devices or whether you have iOS devices or Mac, you can install Microsoft technologies on that. And so to do so, we have the new components that we've added into OneNote. There's a Microsoft Classroom coming out that allows you to turn Office 365 into a, a, a lightweight LMS so that you don't have to go to multiple places in order to post content and share content with students. And then a really incredible new preview that we've put into one that's called the learning tools that allows students that have reading difficulty or even dyslexia to actually improve their reading skills by taking content that you could have gotten from the web or things that you've scanned in and taken a picture of and have it converted so that not only it can read to them, but students can also have a much better reading experience and uh, a variety of new things coming in that space as well for Office 365. But the biggest transition in the 21st century is not our students. I'm always amused when someone tries to tell my 13-year-old daughter about 21st century skills. She was born in the 21st century. She would only know she didn't have those skills if somebody told her that. The person that actually needs the most 21st century skills are our educators. And so we're helping to do that by providing a professional learning community with a Microsoft educator community at education.microsoft.com. And if you go to that website, you can sign up and not only find people domestically in the U.S., but also around the rest of the world that you can use to connect with whether you want to do those virtual field trips or connect across multiple language barriers using Skype and the new Skype translator to actually have people speak in their uh, first language and have it translated using machine learning into the language next to them. So if you want to get more information on this, please go to office.com slash education. You can find out how you can get access to your copy of Office 365 as well as new information that's available on the Windows 10, um, Windows 10 anniversary update, information around Microsoft Classroom will be available at aka.ms slash classroom, and lots of new capabilities that are going to be coming. If anything pops up that you don't know, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at EDUCTO, and we can have great conversations, talk about what's next at Microsoft. But I hope you enjoyed this conversation today with Gary and Education Week and are doing the most you can to prepare our students for the second half of the 21st century. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. And just as a reminder to all today's participants, an on-demand archive will be made available through edweek.org within the next 24 hours if you want to revisit today's presentation. Edweek.org also has a wealth of news and opinion that can help you explore these topics in more depth, as does, of course, Gary Marks' 21 Trends for the 21st Century. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I'm sure that Gary has given us all